Hello. This is Gary Wishon, as promised. Mark Twain on the damned human race. Uh, bear with me. I can read, it's just that when it comes out my mouth, it comes out. Ugh. Uh, I've been trying this for a while, but here I go. Mark Twain is hands down one of the best authors in history. His eloquence, his ability to just dissect liars and scoundrels with an inch of their life. You felt this big after Mark Twain was done with you. Well, here we go. Bible teaching and religious practice. Religion had its share in the changes of civilization and national character. What share? The line share. In the history of the human race, this has been the case, always will be the case, to the end of time, no doubt. Or at least until man, by the slow process of evolution, shall develop into something really fine and high, some billion years hence, say. The Christian Bible is a drugstore. Its contents remain the same, but the medical practice changes. For 1,800 years, these changes were slight, scarcely noticeable. The practice was allopathic, allopathic in its rudest, crudest form, though ignorant physician, day and night, on all the days and all the nights, drinks to his patient with vast and hideous doses of the most repulsive drugs found in the store stock. Bled him, cupped him, purged him, puked him, salivated him, never gave his system a chance to rally, nor his nature a chance to help. Kept him religious sick for 18 centuries, allowed him not a well day in all the time. The stock in the store was made up of equal portions of baleful, debilitating poisons and healing and comforting medicines. But the practice of time confined the physician to the use of the former of the concept consequence of he could only damage his patient and that is what he did not until far within our century was any considerable change in the practice introduced and then mainly or in effect only in great britain and the united states in other countries today the, the, the patient either still takes the ancient treatment or does not call the physician at all in the English-speaking countries, the changes observed in our century was forced by that very thing, just referred to the, re the revolt of the patient against the system. They were not projected by the physician. The patient felt the doctrine in himself. The physician's practice began to fall off. He modified his method to get back his trade. He did it gradually, reluctantly, never yielded more at time then pressure compelled at first he relinquished the daily dose of hell and damnation and administered it every other day and another day and another day passed since and at last only two sundays imagine now that there would surely be a truce the homeopath arrived on the field and made him abandon hell and damnation altogether and administered Christ's love and comfort and charity and compassion in its stead. These had been in the drugstore all the time. Gold labeled and conspicuous amongst the long shelfful of repulsive verges, purges, vomits, and poisons. So the practice practitioner was to blame that they remained unused in the, in the pharmacy. So look. To the ecclesiastical physician of 50 years ago, his predecessor for 18 centuries was a quack. To the ecclesiastical physician of today, his predecessor for the last 50 years was a quack. To every man, his own ecclesiastical doctor of when, what will the ecclesiastical physician of today be? Unless evolution which has been a truth ever since the globes and the sun, planet, solar system were but wandering films of meteor dust, shall reach a limit and become a lie. This is but one fate 
in store for him. The methods of the priests and the parse pastors have been very curious. Their history is very entertaining. In all the ages, the Roman church owned slaves, brought slaves, sold slaves, authorized, and encouraged her children to trade in them long after some Christian people freed their slaves, the church still held on to hers. If any could know with absolute certainty that this was right and according to God's will and the desire, surely was she, since she was God's specially appointed representative on the earth, and so authorized and in an infallible expounder of his Bible. These were the texts. There was no mistake in their meaning. She was right. She was doing in this thing what the Bible mapped out for her to do. So unassailable was her position that in all the centuries she had no word to say against human slavery. And yet now, in the last, at last, in our immediate day, we hear a pope saying slave trading is wrong, and we see him sending expeditions to Africa to stop this. The text remains, it is the practice that has changed. Why? Because the world corrected the Bible. The church never corrects it, and it also never fails to drop in at the tail end of the procession to take credit for the correction, as she will presently do in this instance. Christian England supported slavery, encouraged it for 250 years. Her church consecrated ministers look on sometimes taking a, an active hand. The rest of the time, in different England interests in the business may be called a Christian interest, a Christian industry. She had full share in its revival after a long period of inactivity. This revival was a Christian monopoly. That is to say, it was in the hands of the Christian countries exclusively. English parliaments aided the slave trade, protected it. Two English kings held stock in the slave catching companies. The first regular slaver hunter, John Hawkins, of still re revered memory, made such successful havoc on his second voyage in a matter of surprising and burning villages, maiming, slaughtering, capturing, selling their unoffending inhabitants. Just delighted his queen conferring him the chivalric honor of knighthood upon him, a rank which had acquired its chief esteem and distinction in other chivalric earlier fields. Christian Epper. The knight with its characteristic English frankness and burlesque simplicity chose as his device the figure of the Negro slave meaning and change. Sir John's work was the invention of Christians to remain a bloody, awful monopoly in the hands of Christians for a quarter of a millennium was to destroy homes, separate families, families the slave friendless men and women break the myriad of hearts, human hearts, to the end that Christian nations might be prosperous, comfortable. Christian churches built gospel of the meek and the merciful redeemer be spread or barred in the earth. So in the name the and so in the name of his ship, unsuspected but eloquent and clear laid the hidden prophecy. She was called the Jesus. But at last, in England, an illegitimate Christian rose up against slavery. It is curious that when Christian, when a Christian rises against the rooted wrong at all, he is usually an illegitimate Christian. Members of some despised bastard sect there was a bitter struggle, but in the end, slave trade had to go and went. The biblical or authorization remained, but the practice changed. Then the usual thing happened. happened. The visiting English critic amongst us began straightway to hold up his hands in pious horror 
at our slavery, his distress was unassailable. His words were full of bitterness and contempt. It is true we had not so many as 150,000 slaves for him to worry about, while his England still owned 12 million in our foreign possessions. But that fact did not modify or avail him any. To stay his tears, to soften his censure. The fact every time we try to get rid of our slavery in previous generations, but had always been obstructed off and defeated by England was a matter of no consequence to him. It was ancient history and not worth telling. Our own conversation came at last. We began to stir against slavery. Our hearts grew soft here, there, and yonder. There was no place in the land where the seeker could not find some small budding of sign of pity for the slave. No place in the land but one, the pulpit. It yielded at last, as it always does. It fought a strong, stubborn fight, and then did what it always does, joined in the procession at the tail end. Slavery fell. Slavery remained. The practice remained. Uh, sorry, the text remained. The practice changed. That was all. During many ages, there were witches. The Bible said so. The Bible commanded that they should not be allowed to live. Therefore, the church, after doing its duty for 800 years, gathered up its halters, thumb screws, firebrands, and set about its holy work in earnest. She worked hard at it night and day during nine centuries of prison, tortured, hanged, burned, whole hordes of witches, washed the Christian world clean with their blood. Then it was discovered that there's no such thing as witches, and never had been. One does not know whether to laugh or cry. Who discovered that there's no such thing as a witch? The priest? The parson? No, they never discover anything. At Salem, the parson clung pathetically to his witch text. After the lay hand abandoned it in remorse and tears for the crimes, the cruelties it had persuaded him to do. The parson wanted more blood, more shame, more brutalities. It was the unconsecrated lay person stayed his hand in Scotland. The parson killed the witch after the magistrates had pronounced her innocent. And when the merciful legislature proposed to sweep the hideous laws against witches, witches from the statute's book. It was a parson who came imploring with tears and that they be, that their hands be saved. There are no witches. The witch text remains. Only the practice has changed. Hellfire is gone. The text remains, but the practice has changed. Infant damnation is gone. The text remains, but the practice has changed. More than 200 death penalties are gone from the law books, but the text that authorized them remained. It is not well worthy of note that all the multitude of texts throughout which man has driven an annihilating pen has never once made the mistake of obliterating a good and useful one. It is it does certainly seem to suggest that if man continues this direction of enlightenment, his religious practice may in the end attain some semblance of human decency. Oh, sorry if that sucked. I tried. Goodbye.